ready, sorry. You're ready. You're ready. Court rise. Can I now deal with ground one, briefly, starting with the Divisional Court's single paragraph analysis on this, paragraph 34 of its judgment. So you said you're dealing with round one? Yes. What do you mean? That's the question of statutory construction. Oh, I see. Issue one. Issue one. Oh, ground one. Ground one. Ground, ground one. one. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I was obviously. Anyway. Yep. Paragraph 34 of the Div Court's judgment. What then asks the court of RT's submission that Ofcom, when assessing whether the programmes lack due impartiality, should have considered other TV programmes that RT broadcast? Section 324A makes clear that the impartiality obligation may be satisfied in relation to a series of programs. RT submitted that Ofcom should have considered all of its other broadcasts as part of the series. With respect, we did not. We never submitted that. Uh, um, and so when the judge goes on to answer the question we had not posed, it's not surprising he comes up with an analysis that doesn't answer the question. Um, we never, as I submitted earlier, said that the content of other RT programmes should be analysed as part of a series, which is the statutory content. We submitted that the content of other RT programmes should be considered as part of the content. And more than that, the Divisional Court, going further than Ofcom, considered that no programmes on RT, save those that are editorially linked, could be taken into account. And with respect to Milenif and Mr. Kennelly and his team, they don't seek to support that analysis. Um, but they do say that although adjacent programmes can be taken into account, even if not editorially linked, non-adjacent programmes <laughs> cannot. Um, and we say that there are three flaws in that argument. The first is that it is not that dividing line between adjacent and non-adjacent is nowhere to be found. That word doesn't appear anywhere. It doesn't appear anywhere. It's before and after. Before and after. doesn't appear in the statute. doesn't appear in the code. When it's used, it's used twice, and both times it says before or after. My lord, yes. <coughs> Second, in our submission, it is illogical to distinguish between saying that adjacent programs are relevant and non-adjacent programs are not. <coughs> uh, um, could I ask you, in that context, to look at Ofcom's skeleton at paragraph 34, where they seek to explain this. This is at tab 6 of the core bundle, paragraph 34. They say Ofcom did place some weight as part of relevant context on the RT programmes immediately before and after, but Ofcom explained that absent editorial <coughs> linking, it considered it appropriate to put less weight on adjacent programmes. Again, this approach was justified by reference to the legislative objectives and appropriate in the interest of proportionality. Some viewers may watch a series of adjacent programmes together, hence the conclusion that programming deserves such, such programming deserves some weight, but many may not. Hence, absent editorial linking, this consideration deserves less weight. Um, but if you accept that because some viewers may watch adjacent programmes, such programmes deserve some weight, what is the logic for saying that if people are going to watch, some people are going to watch, indeed many people are going to watch, other RT programmes, and when I get there, Sky, BBC, ITV, etc. 
What is the weight? What, what is the Article 10 proportionate justification for excluding from consideration the content of such programs <laughs> altogether? Well, we can't confuse Article 10 no. justification and statutory construction. No, but in this paragraph, they are dealing with questions of statutory construction. Yes, so and I'm so saying it's, it's illogical. To do with Article 10. My Lord, yes. But I'm also saying that it, it's illogical to say that as a matter of... They, they don't seek to submit. Ofcom don't seek to submit. There is some statutory exclusion from the concept of relevant context to non-adjacent programs. They just say that meets the um, legislative objective and its proportion. They're, they're seeking to rely upon legislative objective and proportionality in the context of a statutory argument about statutory construction. And I'm saying that is A, illogical, and B, is wrong in the sense that if you can take into account programs because people will watch them because they're adjacent, why can't you take into account programs broadcast 10 minutes later on a different channel? Can we just go back to your point about series? Did you not mention the series at all? Is there anything well, about series in your it, what, we, submission? We, we put before the court um, the legislative scheme, which does refer to yes. the possibility of due impartiality being satisfied either by a, the content of a programme itself or a series of programmes. That's the language in the statute. Yes. But we didn't submit that a programme broadcast 20 minutes later without editorial linking was relevant because it fell within the definition of a series. And then the final flaw in Ofcom's approach and in the divisional court's approach is the guarantee point. I've already made that point. In other words, they say you can't take it, you can't take into account non-adjacent, non-linked programs because there's no guarantee that the viewer will watch them. And I've already made my point that there's no guarantee that a viewer will watch anything, or even that a viewer will watch the whole of one program. I, I, I don't want to take this at any length, but if a, no one suggests that in a half an hour program on a particular subject, um, every segment of it has to comply with the requirements of due impartiality in the sense that you can't have view one before the advert break and view two after the advert break, but there's no guarantee that somebody won't switch off after they've listened to the view that they like in the first segment of the program go and get a cup of tea during the advert break and not come back for the second half. So well, the no, no, as a matter of practicality, very often in published material, one just has to work on the basis which is known to be unrealistic, that everyone reads everything or views everything. Yes. So you look at the programme, as you say, the, the unit of assessment is the programme and not any segment of it that is shown to have been watched by a number of people. Yes. Um, one could say that that, that um, same... Uh, line of reasoning could um, carry through to matters which, of course, you're right to say, cannot be guaranteed, but are more likely than not to be the case, given a link or a, 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 the existence of a series. Well, I mean, as it is for Ofcom, I now, I now, I now accept I'm segueing into Article 10, but as, it, as it's for Ofcom to justify interference, there, there's no evidence before the court that um, most viewers are more likely to watch a program editorially linked a week later than they are to carry on watching the immediately adjacent program or the, or the evening news 20 minutes later. Was this a, is it RT a rolling news channel? Yes. I, I mean, it's... You know, there's someone shaking their head at the, from the Ofcom side. I mean, I... I I'm not, this, maybe, maybe there's a, a difference head. of definition. What does my Lord mean by rolling well, news? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a phrase used somewhere in what we've been reading too, is... As I'm saying, a rolling news channel is one which the news is on 24 hours. No, no, it's not. It's not only news. It's right. not like BBC News 24. Yes, so it's not. It's, I suspect it's more like, and I, I'm going to be giving evidence, and I'll be told if I've got this wrong. It's a bit like CNN. There'll be news programs every hour. Okay. There'll be current affairs programs interspersed in the middle, etc. It's not constantly news and nothing but news. Thank you. That's what I want to say on ground one. Can I now move to ground two, Article 10, and deal briefly, because I know it's very familiar territory, with the case law. Um, the first, which I can spend just two minutes with, is the Redmond Bate case. It's the case about the Christian fundamentalist uh, preachers arrested outside the steps of Wakefield Cathedral. Uh, um, it's the authorities bundle 
volume one, tab nine, just one page to look at. Redmond Bates is tab 11. I beg your pardon, tab 11, thank you. And that's authority bundle two. Tab 11, thank you. Um, page 798 at the top. If judgment of Lord Justice Sedley. Letter D. Mr. Keeley, that's the prosecutor's counsel, was prepared to accept that blame couldn't attach for a breach of the peace to a speaker so long as what she said was inoffensive. This will not do. Free speech includes not only the inoffensive, but the irritating, the contentious, the eccentric, the heretical, the unwelcome, and the provocative, provided it does not tend to provoke violence. Freedom only to speak inoffensively is not worth having. And then there's a reference to speaker's form. Um, th that's what I wanted to say about, or to draw your attention to in that case. And it's, in my respectful submission, this goes back to the point um, that my lord, the master of the rolls, referred to earlier in argument about the extremity of the views. There's a sense in the, in the Ofcom <coughs> de decisions, uh, um, there's a sense in which um, Ofcom seem to be saying that because your views are so extreme, uh, that there's e an even greater um, obligation to put the other side of the argument. And that doesn't square easily with what is said here. Well, I suppose the, that might be uh, relevant to the um, question, the Article 10.2 question itself, the real question. Protecting the rights of others. Yes, protecting, protecting the, rights, the of rights of others. Because if it's really extreme, bordering on the harmful or violent, but not bordering on, not actually harmful or violent, so not excluded in Section 2, then I suppose one could see that that being relevant to the question of the, the, the real question under Article 10. My, my Lord, I accept that. So, so to take an example, I suppose, it, 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 it might be said that a programme that um, focused exclusively on an anti-vax um, perspective and listed a hundred reasons why taking a vaccine was a bad thing. Um, you can see easily the harm that could be caused to that, uh, but, but, but by that programme. And so in that context, I can see that my Lord's uh, approach to Article 10 would, would, would be relevant. But we don't accept that's the position in relation to these programmes. Um, the next decision is the House of Lords in Shaler, tab 13. My Lords may recall that Mr. Shaler had been a member of the security services, had signed the usual <coughs> declaration under the Official Secrets Act. He'd left the service. He'd disclosed a number of documents relating to security matters to a national newspaper. And one of the issues in the case was whether the ban on disclosure in the Official Secrets Act was compatible with Article 10. Uh, um, could we look please at page 281? 281 of the appeal cases report, right. which in my bundle is 333 at the bottom. There's a well-trodden reference to the proportionality case law as it then stood in the Freitas and Daly. Uh, um, all I want to pick up is letter G. A close and penetrating examination of the factual justification for the restriction is needed if the fundamental rights enshrined in the Convention are to remain practical and effective for everyone who wishes to exercise them. And then turning to page 283 in due course if my lords could read uh, all of 68 and 69 we're just picking up two sentences top of 68 so it is not enough for the authorities to show in general terms that a restriction on disclosure is needed in the interest of national security by parity of reasoning it's not enough in, in this case for Ofcom to show that in general terms, due impartiality is a good thing. 
for the protection of the rights of others. <laughs> and then at paragraph 69, the problem is that if they are to be compatible with the convention right, the nature of the restrictions must be sensitive to the facts of each case if they are to satisfy the second and third requirements of proportionality. They must be rational, not arbitrary, and must impair the fundamental right no more than necessary. Um, that's all I want to say about Shaler. Can I then deal also relatively briefly with the animal defenders case, first in the House of Lords and then in the Grand Chamber? Um, my Lords will have seen that the divisional court cited extensively from animal defenders across many pages of its judgment. And indeed, in, below, Ofcom suggested that that case was an almost complete answer to our claim. Nonetheless, when one comes to look at the divisional court's analysis of the Article 10 issue uh, 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 at paragraph 64 to 73, there is, I think, one mention of the animal defender's judgment, and therefore almost no analysis of how the principles extracted from that case can or cannot be applied to the current challenge. And in our submission, that's not surprising because ultimately, the animal defenders case and the judgments from the House of Lords and the Grand Chamber, in our submission, give very little assistance in answering the very different question which arises in this appeal. As my Lords will recall, that case involved a challenge to the blanket prohibition in the 2003 Act on paid political advertising. It did not involve any issue concerning the meaning of the due impartiality requirement, or how it should be interpreted and applied to the facts of the case. So all I'm going to do is take you to one passage in the leading speech of Lord Bingham to illustrate one point. But for our part, there is very little in that judgment um, that answers the questions at the heart of this appeal. Can we start, please? It's tab 16. <coughs> Paragraph 26. Could I ask my lords to read 26 through to 28, and I'll make one submission. The sentence I place particular reliance upon is the penultimate sentence in para 28 by letter D, where, where Lord Bingham says, the risk is that objects which are essentially political may come to be accepted by the public, not because they are shown in public debate to be right, but because by dint of constant repetition, the public has been conditioned to accept them. Uh, and we respectfully agree. And translating that across to this case, the Article 10 rights of a channel such as RT, which doesn't repeat the same point again and again. You can't translate that sentence across to this case. That's about repeated political advertising. I'll move on. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to make a submission that's unattractive to my lord. I mean, perhaps, perhaps my lord's observation simply emphasises the point that nothing in the animal defender's case answers the issues at the heart of this appeal. I think my, 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 my submission was simply, if, if anything, it points the other way, that I'm, I'm entirely content with a judicial conclusion that it doesn't really help one way or the other. I haven't reached a judicial no, no. conclusion yet. No. 
I'm that sorry. comes after I'm, the argument. So I'm sounding presumptuous. <laughs> With, I would be content. Um, then the Grand Chamber, my lords, um, that is in authorities bundle one tab eight. Um, the court's assessment, uh, after setting out all the background, starts at page uh, um, of the report 641. <coughs> Paragraph 100. So the court starts with recapitulating the general principles. Sorry, which page are you on? 641. And this is the majority? This is the is. I'm not going to take you to any of the minority judgments. It was a 9 8 majority. It was a 9 8 majority. There was one concurring single opinion from Judge Bratzer, and then there were eight dissenters, grouped in two sets of judges. Um, so, um, this is a recapitulation of the principles from the Mouvement Réen Suisse against Switzerland case. Um, I just <coughs> ask you to read um, the whole of the indented passage in paragraph 100, because this is Strasbourg, Grand Chamber, important statements of principle. then ask you to read 102 and 103 to 104. So basically 102 to 104. So we do rely upon the narrow margin of discretion. We do rely <coughs> upon um, the importance of the rights, as uh, including the right to views that offend, shock, and disturb. And we do rely upon the need emphasized in paragraph 103 to scrupulously examine the proportionality of a restriction on freedom of expression. Now, in the context of that case, as I've already made clear, what was at issue was the blanket ban on political Advertising And a lot of the court's analysis in the following paragraphs are devoted to uh, 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 recounting what, what it already analysed in the factual part of the judgment concerning the extreme level of parliamentary scrutiny afforded to this ban. My lords may recall from the judgment that there had been um, several um, uh, parliamentary committee reports on the, uh, considering the matter it had gone back and forth. The minister hadn't even been able to sign the declaration under the Human Rights Act that, in her opinion, the legislation was convention compatible. There was a lot of discussion about different perspectives in different um, convention member states on the ban on political advertising. There was no conspect of, there was no consensus of European opinion, a a and the court ultimately said, "Look, Parliament has rigorously and carefully thought about whether this ban." is proportionate. It thought about whether a more uh, um, nuanced ban would be capable of being uh, um, 
in, enforced, and, it, and it's finally come up with a judgment that it can't be. And we, the court, um, ought to give uh, uh, respect for that view. Um, and, and although that um, ban was part of the same act as the present due impartiality requirements, and uh, um, the divisional court, like Ofcom, make a lot of the fact that it's all part of a package of measures, uh, there is no suggestion at all that the due impartiality requirement was subject to the same level of parliamentary scrutiny as the ban on political advertising, still less that there has ever been any parliamentary scrutiny of the very questions that we are considering in this case, namely precisely what can and cannot be taken into account within the context of adjudicating upon whether the standard has been met. You're making that point as a, as a distinction, but not as a, not as a um, forefront, as a submission at the forefront of your argument. Agree. Yeah. That's a fair characterization. Uh, that's all I want to say about animal defenders. And the last case is one I've referred to already, the Gaunt case, tab 10. Um, in short summary, Mr. Gaunt was a radio talk show host who, on the day in question, was interviewing a local politician from Redbridge Council about that council's proposal to ban people who smoked from being foster parents. Um, and as will become clear, he had some very strong views about that. Essentially, he had been fostered himself uh, by a lady who had smoked. He thought she was a fantastic foster mother, and he basically thought it was an outrage that children should be left in children's homes when they could be fostered just because the mother happened to be a smoker. Uh, uh, um, so just picking it up at page 228 of the report, 245 at the bottom. Could I, could I ask my lords just to read um, the non-indented part of paragraph 5? Perhaps, perhaps all of paragraph five, if you, if you will. Yeah. And then paragraph seven, the applicant's radio interview with the councillor lasted just over 10 minutes. In the proceedings which follow, the president of the Queen's Bench Division summarised the interview in the terms set out below. Uh, and there are references then to the councillor being a health Nazi, you're a Nazi, etc., etc. And then at the bottom of the page, last paragraph, it is scarcely possible to convey the general and particular tone of this interview in a short summary. And the full transcript is in this respect incomplete. You have to hear it for its full impact. As we have said, it degenerated into a shouting match from the point when the claimant first called the councillor a Nazi. That first insult was not said with particular vehemence, but you ignorant pig was said with considerable venom, and we think gratuitously offensive. The interview as a whole can fairly be described as a rant. Um, Ofcom then commenced an investigation. You can see that from paragraphs 10 to 12. Um, you can see at paragraph 11, Ofcom launched an investigation into the matter under the code Talksport, that's the channel, said it regretted what had happened, accepted that the interview fell below acceptable broadcasting standards. Paragraph 12 in a report, Ofcom concluded that the broadcast had breached rules 2.1 and 2.3 of the code as it fell short of the generally accepted standards applied to broadcast content and included offensive material not justified by the content. Uh, Mr. Gaunt then made his application to Strasbourg, who declared it inadmissible. But can we look, please, um, all the way to um, page 236 at the top, or 253 at the bottom? After a reference in para 43 to the general principles, and I pick it up at paragraph 44. As regards the level of protection, little scope under 10.2 for restrictions on freedom of expression in two fields, namely political speech and matters of public interest. 
over the page, accordingly a high level of protection of freedom of expression, with the authorities thus having a particularly narrow margin of appreciation will normally be accorded where the remarks concern a matter of public interest. Moreover, the court has held that the limits of acceptable criticism are wider as regards a politician than as regards a private individual. A fortiori, I say, where what you're criticizing is a whole state, namely the US or the UK or, or politicians within that state. Unlike the latter, namely unlike a private individual, the former, namely a state or its representatives, in inevitably and knowingly lays himself open to close scrutiny of his words and deeds by journalists and the public at large and consequently must display a greater degree of tolerance. Furthermore, the court has accepted that journalistic freedom covers possible recourse to a degree of exaggeration or even provocation, therefore a degree of hostility and the, close, and the potential seriousness of certain remarks do not obviate the right to a high level of protection given the existence of a matter of political interest. And then paragraph 47, lastly, Article 10 protects not only the substance of the ideas and information expressed, but also the form in which they are conveyed. Consequently, it's not for this court or for the national courts, or I would say for Ofcom, to substitute their own views for those of the press as to what reporting techniques um, should be adopted. Um, in our respectful submission, it is very difficult indeed to reconcile those important principles with the approach taken by Ofcom in its breach decision. It said, well, we know that you gave Ambassador Murphy airtime, but you were, you were pretty rude to him because you interrupted him too much. Or we know that you broadcast um, Ambassador Haley's views in the United Nations. Um, but, but you denigrated them, and, and that's not really acceptable. That, although Ofcom say they're giving effect to Article 10, as I say, it's in, very difficult indeed to reconcile that approach with the principles here. Um, that's all I want to say on the case law on Article 10, and I can now um, deal with the remainder of my submissions on ground two. Um, very briefly. I've already said that nowhere does the breach decision analyse how the rights of others were being protected by interfering with the free speech rights of RT and its audience. And that is so whether one formulates the rights of others as a right not to be harmed or misled, which is one way that Ofcom has put it and that we put it, or whether you formulate it by reference to the democratic right to be exposed to a range of political views on TV news programs. Even if you formulate the rights of others in that broader way, our submission is it does not follow that that is to be judged in a general and abstract way, divorced from the real world impact of the program. In other words, de defining the rights of others more broadly does not obviate the need rigorously to assess whether, given the programme's content, assessed in all of its context, including the dominant media narrative, the audience's right to fair democratic discourse actually required protection by the regulator taking enforcement action against RT. And in making that submission, our case has always been and remains that you have to look at each programme in the real world, in the round, keeping in mind all the contextual matters identified in our written argument. And just, just to remind you, because I'm conscious of the time, if my lords turn to our skeleton, core bundle, page 44. Over. Paragraph 54. If my lords could just read, because it, it captures our case, I hope well. Paragraph 54 and then all of 56.
And that's your case. That, that, that is our case. We've yeah, heard that. Right. Right. Well, I, I won't. <laughs> well, okay, I, I, I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, um, Ofcom's <laughs> primary answer to the first three factors, namely the likely expectation of the audience and the contents of the programmes, and the contents of the programmes adjacent, was to say, well, we did refer to them, and ipso facto, that must be a lawful approach. To which we say, no, uh, um, what you didn't do was assess the likely impact of the programmes on the audience, and to what extent, if any, in light of all of that, it was necessary to take steps to protect the rights of others, whether the right not to be misled or the right to... So what should they have done? Well, they should have considered the content, considered the audience expectation, considered the dominant media narrative, and asked themselves, in circumstances where it is abundantly clear that anybody other than those with a tin ear would have known the view that Russia was to blame for Skripal, for example, do we need to take regulatory action interfering with RT's free speech rights by penalising them for not repeating that view again, or not giving that view more weight again on their own programme? And if they'd have asked themselves that question, do we really need to take this action by making them repeat that view, the answer would have been no. So that's the answer to my previous question, that you would say that no um, statement of the opposing view is necessary in this context. Yes, I, and by saying yes to my lord, I don't accept that there was no statement of the opposing view. No, I understand that. Can I, with that positive case in mind, then just look briefly at the Divisional Court's judgment, starting at paragraph 66. Maybe we ought to pick it up at paragraph 65. RT submit that Ofcom had identified a legitimate aid in the abstract. Ofcom had failed to demonstrate that in assessing due impartiality, regard could not be had to the broadcasters or other programmes that weren't linked. RT relied on statistics produced by Ofcom showing that average viewers obtained news from more than one source. Um, and then it, there's a reference to New Zealand. Can I just show you where in the current bundle the equivalent of that evidence is? It's in the supplementary bundle. Final tab. This is the 2020 equivalent to what was before the divisional court. It's, it's materially identical. So this is a document called News Consumption in the UK 2020, produced by an entity called Jigsaw Research for Ofcom. And in time you may want to look at it all, but if we could just look at the page 342, which I hope looks like that. Yeah, so unfortunately it's a long way around in the electronic. Yeah. You can rotate. Oh, well, you can, but then you rotate the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. anyway. 342. Yeah, it, my Lord Augustus oh. will be, it, look, it looks a bit like that, well, not a bit, but it looks like uh, that. It's some bar charts. Yeah. I'm not sure that 342 has come out as a number. What's the internal number? Uh, 65, I think. Yes, OK. That's what I've got. Thank you. The top of the page says the average number My of news sources right. remains so good now that you can rotate it and rotate it back. How <laughs> <laughs> <I> wonderful. <laughs> Um, the average number of new sources remains flat, with 6.7 individual sources being used across all platforms. And then you can see 
that set out in the left hand set of columns at the bottom. Um, and then on the previous page, could I just ask you to look at the top box under summary of key findings. TV remains the most common platform for accessing local news and news within the nations. BBC One remains the most used source. BBC One and STV are joint top in Scotland. Um, I think in the, in the divisional court we had a kind of league table with BBC and then <coughs> Sky and ITV. We don't seem to have that here, but probably don't need it. Anyway, that, that, that's the evidence to which the divisional court was referring. And then what it said about that is in paragraph 66. The thing is, I was thinking of uh, in page 340, TV remains the most used platform for news, followed by the internet. 60, 75%, 65%. Yeah. 45% social media. And it obviously varies by demographic group. Yeah. But this is, this is what you were referring to when I asked the question about overlap. Yes. It's, it's, it's quite broad, isn't it? Because um, we can tell from this that um, um, the average person uses more than six individual news sources. But we don't know whether readers of The Guardian also read The Daily Telegraph, or whether viewers of RT um, use um, exclusively seven different news sources which provide the same kind of content. No. No. I, 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 I'm that's part of what the Divisional Court was saying in paragraph 66. Essentially, what the Divisional Court said is, well, there's a danger of there being an echo chamber. Yes, uh, well, that's exactly. But th th these figures don't, don't give us an answer. To that. They, don't, no. they don't show us one way or the other. No, you, 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 you cannot exclude the possibility of somebody with certain views only ever looking at the views that suit them. But you can never exclude that possibility, because if somebody doesn't like um, left-wing views, they'll only watch, I don't know, um, right-wing programs, right-wing programs, yeah, and the whole read right-wing newspapers. And the whole point of due impartiality is not to exclude the possibility that people will want to watch things they agree with, but that when they do, they'll get a impartial and adequately impartial view. And so that, I mean, it, it's cloud cuckoo land to say that, um, you know, all readers of The Guardian are going to read The Daily Telegraph and The Daily Express as well to give themselves balance. I mean, that may be something judges do, but it's probably not something that a lot of people do. But it's also cloud cuckoo land to say we can't take into account as part of context um, what the BBC and the Sky and Channel 4 were saying about, um, and the government was saying about who was to blame for Skripal, because there might be a tiny handful of viewers who will only watch RT. It's not about the number of viewers. It's about the, the, the nece it, whether or not action is necessary to, in the interest of democracy and to protect the rights of others. And I think you, the, the problem you have, it seems to me, is that the statute, I mean, the law that is also required in Article 10 to, makes the unit of assessment the program. So, yes. you know, the, it, it is say, the law is saying programs have to be, have to show due impartiality. Now, I understand that that is in context. But you're trying to really drive a coach and horses through the premise. Well, with respect, I'm I'm not. Or well, just a coach, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just trying to um, put a real world. Um, I wouldn't even say gloss. Uh, look at the unit of assessment in the same way that a viewer will look at the unit of assessment, not in a vacuum, just looking at that unit, but looking at that unit. Uh, with the strong likelihood that he or she will also be very well aware of the other um, perspectives I mean, already. That's right, but this is why I put to you at the beginning that your your case has to be higher than your um, making it. You, you're saying, well, it's just here and it wouldn't matter because this is a very unusual case. But actually, you have to go as far as saying 
that in all cases, it is not the case that due impartiality requires the other position to be put in the playground. But, that, but if, if that is what Article 10 requires, then due can mean not putting the other side of the coin at all, as the code itself recognises. Because, because given no, the, the, the code recognises that you don't have to put every point of view, and, it, and obviously it does, but it doesn't recognise that, um, that you don't have to put any other point of view. But all I, mean, I need the to... The guidance may do in paragraph 133, whatever <coughs> we were looking at, but that may be wrong. I mean, but, but all I need to do to win this appeal is to say that in our cases, um, given the dominant media narrative and given what was said in these programs, regulatory interference with the free speech rights of RT and its audience was not necessary to protect the rights of others. And at the moment, um, I, I hear my Lord saying the right of others is not just the right not to be misled. It's the right to access a number of different... <coughs> Voices, so so as to enhance the democratic discourse. But if the if all the democratic voices on the other side of the coin are being sung from the rooftops of every other channel, that cannot be irrelevant in my respectful submission. Notwithstanding that the unit of assessment is the program. Have you told us what you think is wrong with paragraph sixty six? Essentially, just now, yes, because because. What the divisional court has done is to say, look, uh, um, it's essential that all, well, it, it's it's the third, second, third sentence where the judge if says, every if every person is entitled to participate in a modern democratic state, and every person is so entitled, it is essential that all viewers, and not just average viewers, have access to differing viewpoints that enable that individual viewer to come to an informed view on individual topics. So. First of all, as I said earlier, there was no evidence of any significant cohort of people, or indeed any cohort of people at all, who, who only had access to news from one RT program. That was entirely unrealistic. Well, there, there, was, there was no evidence that all viewers did have access to different viewpoints either. N no, but my lord, if one is assessing the strict necessity of a blanket rule that says you can never take into account the content of other programs, surely one has to focus on, or at least consider as relevant, the position of the general majority. Of the never, never say never. I mean, I don't think maybe the divisional court is saying that, but I, I certainly would never say never. Ofcom says never. Ofcom says, no, Ofcom says it is never relevant to take into account the content of programs on other channels. Well, and I, I don't know how anybody can say never, because we can't imagine different kind of news story. I mean, you gave anti-vax as a, um, an example. The factors raised by anti-vax are very, very different Agreed. from the factors that we're dealing with here. And I if we were thinking about this subject in the context of anti-vax, I'm sure there would be dozens of different arguments. We have to be very careful not to stray to the general from the particular. I, I respectfully entirely agree. That's my positive case. That's why I say if it is too extreme to say the dominant media narrative can never be relevant, then there is a mis there is an error in the divisional court's judgment, and there is an error in Ofcom's approach, because they do say the content of the dominant media narrative can never be relevant at all. And if, if the dominant media narrative... Can you just, can just point me to where they say that? Um, I'll find you their skeleton. Well, the, the, the problem with their skeleton is it doesn't really deal with this at all because they took a rather um, poor procedural point that we didn't have any permission to argue with. So they don't really make their position clear in this skeleton. Below, um, I can take you to their skeleton at tab 13. I, I was really thinking in the, in the report. Oh, well, I, I'll, find it, I'll find it for you in the report. Because, I mean, skeletons are all very interesting. People will change their mind when they get on their feet. Um, the, 
book, the way they analyzed it in their report is at page 337 of the core bundle. in the penultimate paragraph where they said in the last sentence any attempt to do so i.e. to rely upon the dominant media narrative would not be appropriate and would not give, be giving those matters namely the need to give the, the need to meet the due impartiality requirement due weight well, that's a rather clunky way of saying it but in every single case when they come to apply that they basically ignore the dominant media narrative and their, their written case below, their oral case below, um, and so far as I apprehend their case in this court, will be it is never appropriate to take into account the contents of the dominant media narrative. And, and, and as my lord know, um, we argue that <laughs> it's permissible to take the dominant media narrative into account under the Act. Um, you see, I think that they would have, I mean, I, I'm not speaking for Ofcom, but if, if they had said the dominant media narrative, if, if George Galloway, in his inimitable style, had introduced the program by saying the dominant media narrative is that Mr. Putin is to blame for the Skripal poisonings, Russia is to blame, and that is the clear view of all the mainstream press in the UK, the USA, Europe, and everywhere. And now I'm going to tell you why we should question that. Now, you know, that might have attracted a different view from Ofcom, rather than the way it does start off, um, which is um, different and doesn't state boldly what the opposing position is. And, and in a sense, what is, you know, they're not saying, as I understand it, whole program has to be devoted to the view of the UK government. They, they're just saying, you have to make absolutely clear what you're combating. But my lord, just, just going back to your question about what Ofcom has said and its approach to the relevance ever of the dominant media narrative. Yes, thank you. Um, my lord will recall, our, our, our case below was that it was consistent with the requirements of the Act to take that into account. The Divisional Court said no, that, that is not what the Act allows as a matter of ordinary statutory construction. And um, we've been refused permission as a matter of ordinary statutory construction to re reopen that. Our, our, only, our only scope for arguing relevant to dominant media narrative is under Article 10. So, well, I mean, that's a perfectly reasonable scope because it's not in the statute. Of course. Uh, with respect, I, I entirely agree. But my point is, uh, we're not in a situation where Ofcom said, well, yes, there was a dominant media narrative that, 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 that um, Russia was to blame for the Skripal poisoning. And nobody disputes that. But nonetheless, it's not relevant for X reason. They've just said we're not taking it into account. And my, my, my submission is if you don't take it into account, leave aside the question of weight, if you don't take it into account at all, that's very difficult to square with the strict need to justify regulatory interference because it's part of the real world. Wasn't the divisional court's view that requiring um, Ofcom to take into account, uh, or uh, you to take uh, other, can, other broadcasters? Yes would make it impossible, impossibly, in, impossibly, impossibly uncertain. I, 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 indeed, that, 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 that is what they say. But um, with respect, that's another error in their approach. Why does it make it in, impossibly uncertain? Again, well, in, in some contexts, what was required to maintain impartiality would change in real time with each broadcast from any broadcaster or any given subject. But it always does. Due impartiality is always context and time specific. We, 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 we're, we're, uh, uh, um, there might be differences in what, what's required on Brexit, on vaccinations, on Skripal, on all sorts of things where, where, where uh, um, the real world changes and different views change. And as I said before, uh, uh, um, the code itself makes reference to 
ascertaining the established view of the majority. I mean, there, might, there might be some cases, my lord, when it is impossible to identify what the dominant view is. There might not be a dominant view. Well, how prominent does a view have to be? <laughs> but how, it's a very good question. As I said it to you earlier, there are some issues about which only RT is broadcasting. However, however, prominent, however dominant it has to be, that line was undoubtedly crossed in this case for the reason that the master yes. controls gave. Because you'd have to have a tin ear not to know everyone was blaming Russia for, the, for, for Salisbury. So I, I totally accept that there might be some cases where the dominant media narrative doesn't exist, is too inchoate, can't be taken into account. I, I, my, my submission is that to say never, which is essentially what is being said against us, is, is, is incompatible with Article and on the facts of this case, there was a dominant media narrative, the existence of which couldn't seriously be disputed, and, and which was not... That way of putting it turns around the submission you made earlier, doesn't it, really? Because you, you're really saying, it, in the, on the facts of this case, it went without saying that there was a, a, a dominant view. Everyone knew. Um, but, Effectively, but, yes. but the evidence doesn't show that. The evidence just shows that people access quite a lot of different... Um, well, media the, sources. Sorry, the, uh, the, 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 evidence, and the evidence tells us that, that, the, that there was a dominant view. There's no dispute about there being a dominant view, about it being promulgated in a variety of sources, but we don't know anything. The, about the evidence from that those sources and the viewers of these programs. The evidence in that graph simply tells you the average number of news sources accessed by the typical viewer. Yeah. But, but, but that's not the same question as on these subjects, Skripal and Syria. Was there a dominant narrative, which if anybody watched anything other than RT, they would have known about? And frankly, well, I mean, I think that you, you may have a point on Skripal. Um, you, you, Syria, I would have thought, is much more nuanced. I wonder how, what proportion of our population knew anything about what was going on in Syria, really. I mean, they may have had heard about um, uh, chemical weapons at some stages and you know, but but it was a long-running saga. I don't even I can't sort of exactly pinpoint in my mind the succession of news from the beginning of whatever happened in Syria to the end. My, my lord, I, I, I accept that the, the 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 dominance of the narrative on Skripal was m more widely disseminated and known than that in Syria. But bearing in mind time, I mean, I, you've accepted that. I, I wonder if you could just carry on with going through the judgment and telling us what was wrong with each of the paragraphs. Yes, <laughs> so, well, I, 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 let me go back to that. Brooks coming to 73, presumably, quite soon. Sorry? Coming to paragraph 73. I, I, indeed. Because <laughs> uh, um, I think there's seven points in 73 that we need your answers. Well, um, I, I've covered a lot of them already. Um, we've set out our case on each of them uh, um, at paragraph 70 of our skeleton argument. Yes. Could I just ask you to turn that up? Yes. And to, a, to a significant extent, what is wrong with the analysis in 73 of the judgment is encapsulated in what I've already said, and to the extent that it's not, it's picked up in paragraph 70 of our skeleton. Okay. Um, well... Is that right? Um, so, you, you, what you have said is that all you, you disagree with the fact that all viewers are entitled to be presented with different <coughs> viewpoints. Well, it's not so much that I disagree with that statement. What I'm saying is, if you're, if you are seeking to assess the justification for a blanket rule that says you can never take into account the dominant media narrative, it is not enough to say that there might be some viewers who would only watch one program. Because uh, uh, um, that small cohort of people, the, the existence of that small cohort of people does not, in our respectful submission, outweigh the free speech interference. Right. OK, I understand that. But move on to the second one. You don't disagree with that. The requirement only applies to broadcast media and but, but that, but that, because of its immediacy and impact. My well, you do challenge that, don't you? No, no. no. My, my point is that that cuts both ways. Um, 
Yes, it only applies to the TV. But, but RT is a TV channel. It's not a newspaper. No, no. Uh, um, but, but, but if the, the, the justification for it only applying to TV, which is that TV is particularly potent, means that it's all the more important that that potent source of news is protected by free speech rights. I don't, I don't accept that the potency of TV makes any of our arguments weaker. It's just a neutral factor. And the same, you say the same about the third reason, um, that it's um, special for news. You say, well, that cuts both ways as well. Exactly. And then um, you can say what you like, or you say that's fine, but you've got to be able to say what you like without any um, due impartiality where the narrative, dominant media narrative is clear. So that there's, it's, a, it's not really, you don't diametrically disagree with this at all. What you do is you say it's different here. That's what you really say. Well, they're either One neutral of, factors yes. or they're insufficient to justify the interference. I mean, the only one you really disagree with is six. I certainly, I certainly disagree with the, the impermissibly uncertain point. And, 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 and as, I know it's not evident, but as a comparator for that, I do rely quite strongly on the New Zealand code, where there doesn't seem to be any difficulty in taking into account, at least, what viewers will know from other sources. So, I mean, that's what I wanted to get through. I know you didn't want to get through it, but <coughs> what you're really doing is you're, you're coming at this by a, from a side attack. So you're not saying any of this is per se wrong, particularly not the final point about the, the risk to undermining the principled aim. But what you say is if you take into account the dominant media narrative in the special circumstances this case, it doesn't. And the, and, the strong and the strong protection afforded to political free speech. Yes, and would I, of course, I'm going to get all that. Yeah. And, and would I be wrong in saying that your, if you had to put money on one of your, one of the ways you put your case, dominant media narrative is what it's all about, because you're not really saying that a program six months later or even two days later provides appropriate due impartiality in this case, because we haven't even been told what those programmes are. Well, I, I do rely upon the programmes, and they're set out in our original arguments, where immediately after... No, no, I know that you, you rely on... The, 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 Boris, I think it was Boris Johnson. Yeah, no, it was Theresa May. Theresa May. Oh, sorry. Okay. Anyway, prime, it was a Prime Minister. It was a Prime Minister. Prime Minister. The time. Prime Minister. Um, giving a speech, you rely on that and that being broadcast. But the, the point is, dominant media, now you wouldn't win on each programme without dominant media. Now. Well, I don't concede that, but I accept that it's a very important part of it. Very important part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Anything else? No, thanks. No, thank you. Yes. My lords, I'll go straight, if I may, to the question of harm, because the Master Rolls asked, what is the harm here? And I think it's been clear in discussion between Bernard Friend and the court that the harm here is not that viewers were misled. Ofcom isn't in a position to know uh, who was behind the assassination attempt of Mr. Skripal and his daughter. The harm is the risk that viewers will only receive one perspective on major matters of political controversy. That is the harm that is sought to be avoided. And why is that a problem, my lords? Well, we, we deal with this in the decision, in the Ofcom decision. And if I could ask you to turn to that in the core bundle at page 335. And it's Sorry, a four, four, five. Three, 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 five, my lord. Uh, it's the decision in the general part. So the, uh, this extract applies to all of the decisions. And it's a quote from the white paper <coughs> that preceded the Communications Act. And it's a short passage. 
but an important one in terms of setting out the purpose behind the due impartiality standard. And so I'll take, I'll take you through it in stages, if I may. Uh, indented passage uh, the, uh, near the top of 335. It says, one of the cornerstones of broadcasting in the UK has been the obligation on all broadcasters to present news of due accuracy and impartiality. There are also important impartiality obligations applied to other programmes. And then this, the government believes these obligations have played a major part in ensuring wide public access to impartial and accurate information about our society and this, and this, my lords, I rely on particularly, the opportunity to encounter a diverse array of voices and perspectives. It's pausing there. Because if a broadcaster is permitted to present only one side of an argument on a matter of major political controversy, the viewers who favour that broadcaster may not have an opportunity to encounter the other side of the argument. And that's not a remote or speculative outcome. Viewers may well favour a broadcaster which is perceived as having a similar world view or even a better focus on sport, for example. It's unreal to imagine that such a viewer will seek out news or discussions of political controversy on other channels, which he does not particularly favour for whatever reason. The risk... Isn't that a bit unrealistic, since in 2000, this kind of special interest channel was not so prevalent? I mean, it, it, life has changed. You know, people get news from the internet, people get news from everything else. Um, the, the, the world in 2000 did not have the situation it's got now with more than 50% of people getting news from social media and the internet and um, uh, a reducing number of people going to get broadcasters and the number of broadcasters we have with special interests that we never used to have, Al Jazeera and French news and German news and goodness knows what else. My Lord, the next sentence in this indented passage addresses the concern my Lord raises. Because it's not just the, encamp the opportunity to encounter, to not just have available to oneself, but to be required to meet a diverse array of voices. This ensures the broadcast media provides a counterweight to other often partial sources of news. And that factor, my Lord, is a stronger factor in favour of due impartiality now than it was in 2000. But the, the fact that the internet works in the way it does, where to some extent you, you don't choose what you access, it chooses you the way it yes. works. That makes it all the more important that Precisely. broadcast media, which depends on old-fashioned view of pressing the remote control to access, has this impact. Indeed. It's, it's, it's the importance of the requirement has grown with the increase of loud and biased voices through the internet and social media. And this is what Parliament foretold in 2000. And it's uh, true, truer now than it was then. And why is that important, my lords? Because, next line in this passage, they therefore contribute. The fact that there is this counterweight, the fact that one can get due impartiality, not perfect equality, but due impartiality of broadcast news contributes therefore significantly to properly informed democratic debate. Because it's all very well, my lord, saying that there's multiple sources of news out there, particularly on the internet, but there may be multiple sources with the same perspective. The, one, the, one of the things I've been wondering is um, when we look at these figures, are we actually looking at the same news? I mean, when we see that people have seven sources, I mean, some people may just go there to find uh, trivial stuff about footballers and celebrities. Yes. Um, that may be six and a half of their sources. Indeed, my and, and, and other people. So do we, do we know? We, 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 in the we don't, we've got? We, we don't know. We don't know. And so at Ofcom, in the absence of perfect knowledge, which even Ofcom with its resources cannot achieve, oh, and this is not Ofcom, this is coming from Parliament, mm -hmm. A scheme has been created which tends to assure, to the extent that it can, as far as practicable, that everyone is forced to confront alternative views on broadcast news, even if they don't necessarily want to. And that's, is, that's required to ensure properly informed democratic debate. 
And I mean, it's just it's just all a little artificial when when you have television stations that avowedly uh, are one-sided. So the BBC, we understand, is intended to be impartial by its constitution and everything else. And we've seen the Broadcasting Act of 1954 in relation to ITN. But um, now we have a whole array of broadcasters who set out to be partial. Indeed, my lord. Now, how does due impartiality work, properly work, as opposed to simply being uh, by rote or, or paying lip service? How does due impartiality work where you have a broadcaster like this and, and, and several others? I mean, RT, I don't think, is unique. I mean, if you, you know, some people spend all their lives flicking through the channels, and I, I, I'm afraid I don't. But whenever I have, I have been absolutely astonished that there are broadcasters um, with a particular point of view. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't, the, the names don't even mean anything to me. Oh my Lord, what you're describing is a complex policy choice. Complex policy choice. It's a, it's a question of how does one, if the object, if the objective is to ensure, so far as is possible, properly informed mm. democratic debate for the good of our democracy, yep. how does one best secure that? There are no guarantees. Parliament, having uh, consulted up before the 2003 Act, requires due impartiality in every programme uh, or series of programmes. But in a completely different world context. And the first question I would have is, do we construe this legislation I had a case about this recently, as at 2003 when it was enacted, or do we construe it as at now? Well, Mr. Binsey can make some submissions about that, but the normal approach is one construes it by reference to the date of the decision. It's the lawfulness of the decision that's being challenged. Um, if you were being asked to challenge the, the whole statutory scheme itself, there may be a different approach. But you approach this as at the date of the decision. It's the decision that's challenged, the decisions that are challenged. But, but, but I, I don't shy away from the point that, however unreal it may seem to my lord, Parliament has taken a view as to how to best secure properly informed democratic debate and with the internet in mind. And both the White Paper and the Divisional Court have respect correctly identified the growing uh, multiplicity of biased news sources on the internet and the per pernicious effect that, that can have on properly informed democratic debate makes the due impartiality requirement all the more important. And then ultimately, my word... Pernicious effect, words like pernicious effect are dangerous in the context of a station that attracts a few hundred, maybe a few thousand viewers. I mean, we're not... The, 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 there is a difference here. I mean, if this were a BBC broadcast attracting a million people for every news bulletin throughout the day, you know, you, you might have pernicious as a good word. Here we're talking about a limited, and yet you still have to show it's necessary. Yes, and my lord, the, 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 the 2,300 and so viewers of RT and the expectations of those viewers is factored into the assessment, which mm -hmm. is why a, a certain degree of bias is permitted on the part of channels like that. That is, that's, it is. It is factored into yeah, the process. That's said, that's said very it, clearly. Indeed, indeed. But there's a basic minimum standard, due impartiality, which is required for everyone. And my own friend made submissions about, well, there may be, a, say, there's 100 broadcasters. In fact, there are 2,000 TV licenses in the country. And he says, let's say there's 100. 90 are expressing one view. Why can't the 10 express the diametric, diametrically opposite view? Well, where do you get, I mean, that, that submission crept in, if I may say so. Where do you get out of the statute that there is a basic minimum standard of due impartiality that must be applied in applying an Article 10 test? No, my lord, the basic minimum standard is, it's my submission, is due impartiality. That, that rule applies to everyone. The point I want to make to my lord is that Mr. Grzynski's submission suggested as if uh, his clients were somehow constrained from expressing a view in the face of um, bias expressed by others. But they are all subject to the same requirement of due impartiality. This rule applies to all broadcasters. And I'll come back to the relevance of that for the dominant media narrative point. But I'm dealing here with a more fundamental question, which is 
Parliament has made a policy choice as to how, uh, how best to secure properly informed uh, democratic debate. It does that by way of the due impartiality requirement, and by statute it requires Ofcom to define what is meant by a series of programs. Okay, you're going to take that submission a bit more slowly because I think it's important. Parliament has made a policy choice as to as to how to be, how best to secure yes. that uh, all viewers have an opportunity to encounter a diverse array of voices <laughs> to ensure that the broadcast media provide a counterweight to other often partial sources of news. They're, sorry, again you went a bit fast. I'm sorry, Mike. The, you're reading out. I'm, I'm just reading from the decision. Paper. I'm reading from the white paper, which is in the decision. So this is where we'd like to have um, live Nate because uh, we then have seen what you said the first time. It sounded rather good. <laughs> it's not me, well, it's, it's the white paper. But it's the Parliament has made a policy choice to have... John. The Parliament has made a policy choice as to how best to secure yes. properly informed democratic debate. <coughs> you said first time, have an opportunity to encounter yes, and so, um, a diverse so, array of so voices. The, the policy cho my Lord asked me what policy choice has Parliament made, and I said the choice was how best to secure an opportunity that all viewers have an opportunity to encounter a diverse array of voices and perspectives, thus ensuring that the broadcast media provide a counterweight to other, often partial, sources of news, I would add, particularly from the internet, and thereby broadcast media contribute significantly to properly informed democratic debate. Because yeah. because the concern that the divisional court uh, and it's the concern that Ofcom expressed to, to them. What was the risk of the echo chamber? And, and this is not a speculative. The, the, by that I mean, and this is what Lord Lord Dingman said, the risk that that viewers will only take their news from the sources that they like or prefer, and will only hear views with which they agree, or views that are given to them on the basis of what they have indicated they like as the internet operates. And the risk is that they will then never be exposed to alternative views. And, and my lord, in exchange, Mr. Brzezinski suggested, well, is that really realistic? But my lord, it is uh, a reality in other jurisdictions. And if I may say so, the elephant in the room for these purposes is not UK-Russia relations, as my friend suggested. It's the same elephant that was in the courtroom in Alan, Animal Defenders, which is the position in the United States. Because that, if you want to see what happens when there's no requirement of due impartiality, one sees it there. Sure, there is a vigorous broadcast media. Uh, but, and here I'm giving evidence impermissibly, <laughs> and, and will correct me, but it would be surprising. As surprising if a Daily Mail reader was to subscribe to The Guardian, if viewers of Fox News regularly took their views from MSN. Uh, MSN it's as polarized as a, as, a, as a press media. In this country, indeed, you would indeed. say, indeed, and 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 where, and there is no requirement for due impartiality in any media in the states, as far as we're aware, in broadcast media, there is no such requirement. And then you have a situation where, uh, and one saw this particularly with the former president of the United States, where supporters start to question the very fundamentals of the democracy in which they live, on both sides, because they are never genuinely exposed to the views of the other side. And that's the echo chamber. That's the very thing which the UK regime seeks to avoid. Sure, my lord, you could say, well, RT has got a small number of viewers. Is that really necessary? And that fact is taken into account as, it did, as we did and, in that And there are impartiality yeah. regimes in place in other U EU countries? Sorry, in EU countries. In, uh, yes, there certainly is. Yes. Yes. Um, and I can, I can address you that in detail in the morning if you need more information. The First Amendment would probably rule out any... In the United States, the First Amendment would mean it would be impossible. And in fact, the, the House of Lords said so in, in the Senate. But 
So, so this is, as I say, this is not some remote speculative outcome. This is the reality in another powerful Western democracy. And uh, th that's the point we make uh, by reference to the white paper. Uh, when our friend speaks about the importance of diversity of views, it's not enough to have views out there in the ether. The scheme seeks to ensure that people genuinely encounter these views in a duly balanced way. <coughs> the debate, the debate that we all agree that is necessary for a functioning democracy requires a venue. Do you say never? My Do you way? say that dominant media narrative can never um, be relevant to whether or not a program is duly impartial? Uh, certainly, in this case, we gave... I know you uh, say in this case. <laughs> Well, my lord, no, I, I'm, I'm going to be, because the, the concept of a, of a dominant media narrative is so uncertain, so ill-defined, that it is impossible to make any submission about it in any constructive way. What we have you, said, see, you say that, and the divisional court said that, but is that really true? A dominant media narrative is uncertain in most cases, but in the extreme case, it may not be. Now, let's go away from this case, because some may say Skripal was not a dominant media narrative because that's the case for um, RT here. But there are cases where there is a dominant media narrative which is quite um, clear, aren't there? I mean, I don't want to give an example because I'd only be told it's, it's a bad example. But there are cases where in our society some things are pretty well totally accepted. Um, and and in relation to, so, so you've seen at the end of our skeleton, an approach like this, to make absolutely clear, we, we, our position is that we do not say never, yeah. never can this be relevant. We, we have not shut our minds to the possibility that even for an unlinked, non-adjacent program, there may be a, context, a contextual factor to... So, so would it be play. enough? Let's, that, that answer satisfies me. You'd never say never, <coughs> and I would never say never. So if Mr. Galloway had started the program by saying um, mainstream media has made it perfectly clear that uh, they've already been the judge and jury in Mr. Putin's trial for the Skripal poisoning, they are saying in um, as clear terms as one can hear from the Prime Minister downwards that the Russian state and Putin are responsible for this poisoning, this program aims to give you an alternative point of view. Now, if he had said that without sarcasm, without, um, you know, he just said it, I mean, which a lot of broadcasters would be perfectly capable of doing, is that enough? My Lord, as you said, I mean, could it be enough? Yes, 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 of course it could be enough. Yeah, okay. Because it's, it's, it's within the broadcast, it's within the program. It's, it's, it, Mr. Galloway will then go on to comprehensively denigrate the view, but at least it was presented in a fair way. Would, would it be enough to say, <clears throat> as you will have heard on our last news bullet, the Prime Minister made a speech accusing Russia of responsibility? I gave a, I gave a provisional yes to that, my lord. I'll be told if that's not sufficient linking, but somebody will tell me. But you, one can work on the basis of that my answer to that is yes until I'm told otherwise. Because there's a link. One would expect, the question is, would it be a clear enough link, but at least there's a link. Because the importance of the link is not just that the viewer will go on to watch the linked program, but that the viewer at least is told there is an alternative which is being to which he is being directed by the program in question. So then why is it so binary? Um, why is the, the answer to the do um, to, to, the, to the, the key question um, so binary when in fact the question you've got to ask is the one under Article 10.2? In other words, is it necessary in the interest of a democratic society to protect uh, the rights of others? Because I don't understand how the two match up so as to get that um, quite clear answer. Yes, you have to have it within the program. Yes, you have to have it clear and not sarcastically given or clearly linked to it. But provided you do, you're OK. You don't have to bang on about it because the rest of the program is explaining another point of view. Yes. Um, how does that mean that that is sufficient to make it necessary to stop anything that doesn't comply with that in the interest of democracy?
democracy and serves to protect the rights of others. When, as Mr. Krasinski would say, only very few people don't already know all that. Because this, this is the, the second key point. The first point I want to make to my lords was harm. You have my point on harm. The second is the relevance of the statutory scheme. Because the court, does, and now there's Ofcom, come to Article 10 cold. We take this decision in the context of a statutory scheme created with Article 10 directly in mind. And that's both in the position of Parliament, but also code and guidance produced by Ofcom. And I took you to the extract of the white paper in the decision, because that's the harm sought to be avoided. The question then is, how do we, how do we address <coughs> the risk of that harm arising? Uh, and it's true, we don't use the word harm or the rights of others. We do it by applying the due impartiality standard. Because the due impartiality standard is what Parliament has created to avoid the risk of that harm. And so our close factor analysis is our application of the due impartiality standard. Sorry, could you slow down? Oh, we decide on harm and the rights of others by applying the due impartiality test laid down by Parliament. Yes. Then what? And, and that's how we strike the balance in each individual case for the purposes of Article 10 2. It is in applying the due impartiality standard with the flexibility built into the code. So why is it not necessary um, to apply um, a deep and search? I can't remember the words because um, I know that lawyers love to, love to use hyperbole, a deep and searching analysis in every case. Because the deep and searching scrutiny, the, the deep and searching scrutiny which Ofcom applies, it applies it by way of the application of the due impartiality standard. That that and we certainly did that in this decision. It's a lengthy decision, and it's not just paying lip service to the Article Ten Two position and the Article Ten One rights. Of so you, you said that the deep and searching analysis is built in to the due. Is it built into the due impartiality test? Due, it's in the, the application. It's in the application of the due impartiality test that we apply that, that, that um, scrutiny. You see, why is it? I mean, what, what I, I mean, I, I see all that, and it sounds good, if I may say so, Mr. Manager. But what I don't really see is why you should avoid asking the real question about the interests of democracy and the whether it's necessary um, to protect the rights of others. For example, if, you, if I was asking myself, is this necessary to protect the rights of others, I would ask two questions. Who are the others? How many are there? And what do they know? Right? Yes. But none of that happened. Well, who are the others here for this purpose? The VRT viewers, in the, in the narrow sense of the what do they know? We can never know what they How know. How many are there? What they don't know. But we do know, pursuant to our statutory scheme, that it is critical that they, in common with every citizen in this country, it has the opportunity to encounter, properly encounter, a, a diverse array of perspectives. So we are seeking to protect them, as we seek to protect all citizens and all viewers, uh, to ensure they receive this a diverse array of voices in order to avoid a situation where the RT viewers, it's the R RT today, it could be the viewers of a Chinese state-owned company tomorrow, to ensure that they receive a due, balanced view of other perspectives. Well, why don't you, in that analysis, look at, just think about what they might have heard elsewhere? And we, and, well, first of all, it has to be a workable test for them. May I come back, my Lord, may I come back to this? The standard we're applying here, the standard of due impartiality, has to be applied by them, by the broadcasters. Yeah. They need to know if the, what they're about to broadcast will comply with this standard or not. And, and this is the real problem, because, and this is why I say that the statutory scheme helps you find the answer. The duty of impartiality, due impartiality, is imposed on the broadcaster itself. Each broadcaster has a duty on itself to preserve and that's an important word, not to take a 
Cantor with regard to, but to preserve due impartiality in the series of programs or in the program, in each individual program. And that means, as a matter of principle, it's difficult to see how that broadcaster can rely on what third parties may or may not say, third parties entirely outside its control, what they may say will inform it as to whether what it's about to do will or will not comply with due impartiality. And, and to be very clear, Ronan Frank Skeleton does not say that the dominant media narrative is informed by other broadcasters. Uh, paragraph 50, uh, paragraph, it's in the skeleton, and uh, I'll get the reference in a second. Sorry, it's an important point, so I will actually try and give it to you. It's where he, discu it's, he discusses how the dominant media narrative is. Ah, yes, 56.5, paragraph 56.5 in the United States. He defines the dominant media narrative not by reference just to broadcasters, but by all media outlets. Broadcasters and other media outlets, he says. It's not limited to broadcasters. So, so how then is any broadcaster to know whether it's about to breach the due impartiality requirement? It has no idea what the 2,000 television licensees or the thousands... That's almost straight, stupid, because the dominant media narrative in China would be different from the dominant media narrative in England. So it has to be in the UK. It has to be... Social media is borderless. So um, it, in that sense, it really is uncertain. Yes. But, uh, well, let's assume, in fairness to my friend, that it's all media outlets uh, communicating with UK citizens. That's still thousands and thousands of different outlets. The content of what they're about to produce is, will be entirely unknown. And even if you say in the context of the Skripal attempted assassination, one can guess, it's not a satisfactory way to set a statutory standard to say that we can guess that there's going to be a barrage of anti-Russian criticism, and therefore we can do something really quite biased, because we can anticipate um, that at least the large broadcasters are likely to... Is, is there a point more that I to interrupt you? Kennedy, is there a point about the dominant media narrative being different for the viewers of RT? I mean, the viewers of RT are likely to have a particular interest in Russia, and they're likely to get a dominant media narrative from their Facebook pages about Russia, and then their dominant media narrative may be exactly Putin-based. Well, my, indeed, and, and our duty is to ensure that they are protected, that they, even though they may not want it, are exposed to um, alternative viewpoints to preserve democracy in this country. And, and we do that by imposing this due impartiality requirement on all broadcasters. And, and th to the extent that they have different expectations in different viewer um, bodies, that's in that is addressed in the flexible standard we apply. Um, so so the, the idea, first of all, the, idea, the concept of a dominant media narrative is far too vague to form the basis of a condition in a statutory code. It's impossible to predict how, uh, what it even means so that a broadcaster would know how to avoid breaching it. <coughs> and in, and, and then that's, that goes to the point when our friend made that, well, Ofcom can survey the, the market. Ofcom has an insight into what's going on. Even for Ofcom, it would be impossible to work out the varying dominant media narratives applicable to various people, including what they get from social media. It's certainly impossible. So uh, and although the concept of dominant media narrative has a certain attraction, it has a certain ease, it's a meaningless concept in reality, far too vague to form the basis of, uh, to form part of the conditions imposed on broadcasters uh, under the scheme. And, as I said at the beginning, it's fundamentally contrary to statutory purpose, which is that each broadcaster must satisfy itself at what is about to um, transmit satisfies the due impartiality requirement, and that is Parliament. That's not Ofcom. Where that's does the each broadcaster must satisfy itself come from? Which section? Section 321B of the Act. But, but most importantly of all, perhaps, coming back to the statutory purpose, even if um, it were possible to anticipate the dominant media narrative, still doesn't address the fundamental problem, which is that 
But Mr. Grzynski, what my friend's submission ultimately goes to is one can have a series of broadcasters all broadcasting extremely biased material, um, but in the overall sense, balancing one another out because of the various changing dominant media narratives will shift from hour to hour and day to day. So, but so what's Ofcom done then with all these minority broadcasters that have particular viewpoints? Ofcom is it, is it brought due impartiality claims against them all? Ofcom approaches them uh, applying the due impartiality standard in the flexible way which you've seen in this case. And no doubt my lords have seen the decisions where we found that uh, RT was not in breach as well as the ones we found in breach. And to answer my lords' questions earlier, um, in 2018, we found 10 breaches of the due impartiality uh, standard in 2019, five and in 2022. So it does happen. It doesn't happen very often. And um, partly because there is a... Oh, well, well, 2018-7 were RT breaches in 2018, yes, exactly. So, so the point, my lord, is there haven't been many. RT obviously had a bad year in 2018 <coughs> for reasons which are obvious, bless you, my lord. When you come to read the... So were the five in, sorry, were the yes. five in 2019 just one broker? No. No, there was uh, two, three, broad, three broadcasters. One radio and two news. <coughs> but my lord's... The reason why the number is relatively small, notwithstanding the large number of broadcasters in the country, is because Ofcom approaches the due impartiality standard with flexibility. It does not expect RT to broadcast as if it were the BBC. It takes into account the differing expectations of its audience, as you saw in the decision. But there is still a basic minimum level of due impartiality which is required. And that's what was applied in this case. And any and I, and, and I do urge, in other words, other than Master Rose, to, to view the broadcasts. The transcripts don't do them justice. One sees when they're viewed um, why Ofcom felt it. Well, well, I mean, that that is, if I may say so, not really a submission. I mean, you you see um, a uh, a display of an using the word, I think, correctly, an extreme point of view that would, in most viewers, UK, most UK citizens would be surprised about. But um, I don't think you see uh, why Ofcom has to act if you accept the proposition that people are entitled to have free freedom to express even extreme, even shocking views. I mean, that is the, you know, that's the Lord, this tabular... Is, this, this has nothing to do with extreme views. Exactly. That's why watching the programmes, although it's, it, it is entertaining and interesting, is not the answer in this case. No, not at all. But the reason, and I don't ask you to view it to see that it's extreme. I ask my words to reflect on the extent to which the other view is being given any weight at all. It's not about well, how I think the problem with the broadcast, that uh, as my recollection, virtually universally, even where they do state or have other, you know, Ambassador Murphy or, or the um, whatever, Miss Ambassador Haley, Haley. Haley. Uh, even when they have those on, the, the approach to them is sarcastic, um, slightly. Uh, well, it's more than, with respect, Margaret, it's more than sarcastic. Well, at least sarcastic. At least sarcastic, yes. yes. Dismissive, I think, was the word they used in the, in the decision, in, 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 in respect to some. Some of them. One sees that even more clearly in, 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 the, in the broadcast. But, but the reason why I said that um, relying on a dominant media narrative conflicts with the fundamental principle of the policy, the purpose, is that it assumes that viewers will get their uh, news from diverse sources, that the Daily Mail reader will read the Guardian. I appreciate that's not broadcast. And you have my point. No, no. I mean, I, I and, think and, that's and a ridiculous assumption. I mean, but that's the fundamental. Mail reader certainly probably wouldn't in most cases. And people do, as we see from the internet, like the position where they are fed news reinforcing yeah. their prejudice, my whatever their prejudice. My other friend's whole case in Article 10 depends on the court assuming <laughs> that these people will get alternative viewpoints that will be very different from the one they're getting from RT. I mean, I made the point, and of course judges always like the points they make themselves, but... Um, so we'll, we'll treat it with a certain <laughs> caveat. 
But it does seem to me that the kind of people who watch RT are likely to have a Russian news feed that supports Trump in their Facebook and so on, that supports their own point of view. And, you know, they're not likely to be the kind of people who read The Guardian, The Financial Times, The Times, The Telegraph, you know, and all the newspapers in England and takes everybody's point of view. But they may be people who occasionally hear the BBC, whether voluntarily. The, the risk, the risk to our democracy, if if uh, people end up in silos where they don't hear other people's point of view at all, you get all their news, increasingly hysterical news, from one biased source. So you're concerned not so much about the dominant media narrative, but the dominant personal narrative. Each individual viewer and listener and reader, increasingly, only chooses uh, access news which they're sympathetic to, and and, be, and becomes increasingly isolated from the alternative view to the point where, as we have seen in the United States. They cease to even understand how the other side could have that point of view at all. And that is corrosive to democracy. And I don't use these words lightly. This is the, the basis for the for Parliament's clear steer in the 2003. And, that, and because of the importance of that harm, the risk of that harm, and the due impartiality requirement, um, is the expression of how, in this country, that harm is sought to be avoided. So, I mean, you rely on animal defenders because you say, that was quite extreme case, Animal Defenders, a complete ban on political advertising. Um, and yet, that got through not only our courts, but also the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, animal Defenders were only just. just. <laughs> <laughs> a win is a win. <laughs> the, the, it was a 20 second advertisement, quite a mild advertisement for animal rights welfare, a cause with which many of us would have a lot of sympathy. But nevertheless, uh, the ban was upheld even in that case, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the applicants urged a more moderated, um, staggered approach to the ban on political advertising. And, and at a 40 I here, where nothing like an absolute ban is imposed, we're asking RT and other broadcasters to make really small adjustments to the way they present views. My, my friend said he didn't accept, in the first instance, that um, his programs were uh, partial. He said in submission, well, obviously some views are given more uh, weight than others. Well, that's an admission of partiality. The question is, was it duly, was it unduly partial? And that I fully accept you didn't accept. But we, al we allow partiality. It's a question of whether it's undue. And that's where the regulator is. Um, so, but anyway, you have my point, I've made it several times, that the real problem with this dominant media narrative is that there's no, it, it, if that's the, the approach, there's a real risk people will only get the views that they want to get, and that's the very thing which Parliament sought to avoid. Now, uh, I, w I will take, if I, I've taken these rather out of order because I want to go straight to the question which the court was plainly um, interested in. Um, I presume I don't need to show you the legislation because uh, you've obviously read that very closely. Um, but, and, and you have my submissions on the fact that... I mean, it would be helpful to me if you made some submissions on the structure of the code. Yes. Which I find strange, frankly, that context is defined in an understandable way by reference to harm and violence, and then used in a slightly less understandable way in relation to Section 5. Yes. So, uh, I, I will take you to the code, and... And I'm making excellent time, so we'll so talk about it in the morning if it helps. By and I mean, you, may, by lunch. you may want to look at it. I mean, I always think these documents, when one is construing a document like the code or even a statute, um, looking at the whole thing helps. And being provided with bits doesn't help. And we've been provided with any bits of the code. I know it's on the internet, but it would help me to have a copy of the whole code. I'm sure. The court can have that. We'll have that for you uh, overnight. And yeah, thanks. And tomorrow. Um, I, so before I leave, so I won't take you to the provisions of the Act, um, but I will make the point, which I know the court has, that Section three hundred twenty-five um, asks Ofcom to define what a series of programmes is. The Parliament, uh, my friend, very fairly acknowledged this. Uh, the code um, has a has very strong force because it Parliament has asked Ofcom to develop standards. Standards and expressly provides that Ofcom shall 
define them and define them as Ofcom did, consistently with the purpose underlying them. And so I will take you, if I may, then to the code now. And if there's anything I've missed, I can come back to it um, in the morning. The code is in the core bundle, line tab one. Is it not in the authority? Oh, forgive me, the authority bundle. So, my friend took you to page three, and in section two, harm and offence, the meaning of context. Now, it's quite right that section two deals with harm and offence, um, and context appears in that section. But throughout the code, references are made to context, and that reference is then cross referenced back to this definition in section two. So the meaning of context, which you see on page three, internal page number 17, uh, is designed to apply the whole of the code. And one has to bear that in mind when one asks what role it plays in section five. Because there are aspects of context which are expressed here which wouldn't fit easily with the due impartiality question. It's because context here is to apply uh, throughout. And of course, it's, it's a list of factors which um, um, may go to context, and it's not limited to that. So it's a very broad context. Not all those factors are relevant to impartiality, are they? Yes. Um, but we acknowledge in the fourth bullet that there is a reference to what other programs are scheduled before and after the program or programs concerned. And I suppose, Margaret, before I develop this further, if I could just make a very short submission on how we uh, justify our reliance on adjacent programming, notwithstanding the fact that Parliament in Section 320 requires broadcasters to uh, preserve due impartiality in every program or series of programs. Uh, we accept uh, that context is important, but it's also true that a contextual factor cannot be used to undermine the statutory purpose or the statutory standard. You've seen what the purpose of the due impartiality standard is from the extract from the white paper quoted in the decision. And the standard, the standard is that set out in section 320, namely a requirement that due impartiality be shown by the broadcaster in every program or series of programs. But, so we can use contextual factors to ask if due impartiality is respected, but we can't do it in a way that undermines the either the purpose uh, or the standard. And in this case, Ofcom did take into account adjacent programming where it could, even though that was not linked. It wasn't a series, but we felt... Why did you take into account adjacent and not programs before and after? Because we took the view that directly adjacent programming uh, was relevant content. And we could rely upon it, although not to a very great extent, without undermining the statutory purpose or the statutory. So the immediate, it's literally immediately before the program or after the program. Indeed. So whatever, even if the weather forecast or tweet of the day or something. Well, right? between, well it's not been good enough. No, right? it, that may seem facetious, but where do you, where do you draw the line? No, it, it would be if we're asking, have they shown due impartiality? We found that a relevant contextual factor could be that an alternative viewpoint was presented immediately before or immediately after the program in question. We couldn't give that very much weight because the, the parliamentary, the, the, the statutory standard and purpose is that the broadcaster has to, has to satisfy in the program or a series of programs which are defined as clearly linked, an editorial, clearly linked programming. That's the standard we have to apply. But so would, the, the, would, would the goes without saying point um, apply there? So let's suppose. Um, well, as you have on the BBC radio, you have the news broadcast, and then immediately the current affairs programme follows straight afterwards. So you've got the headlines, yeah. and the current affairs commentary goes straight into the news view about the main story of the day. Yeah. Um, and that's all they say. The main story of the day is the script I'll point to. Yes. And you've already been told what the 
dominant media narrative of that. You, you could have, couldn't you, in that context, no further reference to uh, the extreme. You could have no further reference to what the, what the actual story was than this is the main story of the day. In, in that particular context, yes. in those particular... So due context, impartiality, that might be a context be in enough. which the actual programme yeah. contained no statement of what, of what the proposition was, but was mm -hmm. so closely connected. But also because everyone has that, everyone knows exactly how that works. Yeah. So that everyone understands exactly what the link is. Presuming national, broad, BBC, uh, other broadcasters have quite sophisticated guidelines with internally and processes internally to make sure that these they don't trip up on. They absolutely do. Yes. Um, so, but, but so here, although the statutory standard clear standards that the broadcaster has to ensure due impartiality in the programme or a series of programmes as defined, we felt we could give some weight to immediately adjacent programming, although, as we said in our decision, not much weight, much less weight than the other contextual factors, because to give it much greater weight would risk undermining the statutory standard and statutory purpose. What we couldn't do was take into account unlinked and unadjacent programming, because to do that would be to undermine the statutory standard. Can I, can I ask you about the statute itself that slightly troubles me? Um, everybody assumes that the statute is talking about the program as the unit of review. But if you look at section 3191, it says it's Ofcom's duty to set and from time to time review and revise such standards for the content of programs to be included in television services. And then in 320, which is obviously more relevant, the requirements include the preservation in the case of every television program service. Television and radio service. I know, I'm just cutting it out for Sorry. the purposes of what we're talking about. In case of every television program service of due impartiality, etc. And the so so although Later, of course, you have the requirements about series of programs um, and the special requirements. And I, I don't see specifically how one says that a program, um, television program service equals a television program and only a program. And it, it does not. No. Um, it's never been our case that the words television program service means an individual program. No. The parties, and I think it's been common ground, Mr. Pekinski acknowledged this earlier, uh, accept that um, because section 324 <laughs> specifies that the due impartiality requirement may be satisfied uh, in relation to a series of programs taken as a whole, a series to be defined, the due impartiality requirement under this provision uh, cannot be satisfied by a broader category of programs. So therefore, oh well, Mr. Brzezinski will address you in reply, but the, uh, the point is that under the Act, uh, the due impartiality standard is to be, because it says it may be satisfied by a series of programs, we infer that it cannot be satisfied by the whole television service but plainly, if it can be satisfied by a series of programmes, it may also be satisfied in each individual programme. Well, is there another point on construction, which is subsection 1 of section 319, which imposes a duty on Ofcom to set standards for the content of programmes? Yes. Yes, indeed. That's plainly relevant to the point that we're discussing. But, uh, and, and we contrast how due impartiality is imposed on TV program services with the uh, <coughs> standard for local radio services. Uh, because local radio services may comply with the due impartiality <coughs> standard by reference to their whole service. This is 321C. Uh, 321C and the, and the reference to allowing them to show due impartiality across a service as a whole, not a program or individual series, is section 320 sub 4 sub B. I mean, the, the 
one is a little more ambiguous because it says such standards for the content of programs <coughs> to be included in television services. And then the next section says television program services. <laughs> my, my primary submission is based on 320, which is that the fact that Parliament says you can do it by way of a series strongly suggests that it can't be done more broadly. It has to be a series or, of necessity, all the programmes that the broadcaster shows. And another reason why it's very unlikely that Parliament, uh, provided that the due impartiality requirement could be satisfied more broadly, is the uh, provision for more broad satisfaction in respect of local radio. And I suppose you can also say that the code makes it absolutely clear it's talking about the programme, yes. and that it's not, has not itself been judicially reviewed. Precisely. Yes. Yeah. And, and I heard my own friend to say to, before you today that he accepted the unit of assessment as the programme. A series of programmes, but he will have an opportunity to reply to, to address you on that. But that's, that's where we get that from. Is the unit of whatever mentioned anywhere in any of this guidance or anything? The code, the code is, a cl is, is the, the clearest uh, reference. The, a unit, I, I haven't seen the words unit of assessment in the code, but Mr. Gazinski used that expression with, with you and Lord today. I'll be told if it appears in any of our guidance. No, I don't. Sorry, you're told what? I will be told if that expression, yeah. unit of assessment, well, appears I'm somewhere. I'm just doing a search. It's not, in our, it's not in our code. Or we get unit in United Kingdom, opportunity in community. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it's, <laughs> it's not a term of art in the Act. Or it's a forensic flourish or a, a label. Indeed. So back to, back to the code, uh, my lords, if you have the authorities bundled before you. And turn, please, then to page page seven of the bundle, internal page twenty eight. This is section five. You have the meaning of due impartiality. You have my submissions on the flexibility inherent in the due impartiality standard, and the acknowledgement that context is important. Again, you have my point that a contextual factor can't uh, undermine the statutory purpose or standard. Um, and then 5.5. This is the point, my lord, that you put to me a moment ago on paragraph, sorry, page 30, internal number. Due impartiality in matters of political or industrial controversy and matters relating to current public policy must be preserved on the part of any person providing a service. This may be achieved within a programme or over a series of Does the rest of the code refer back, any of our provisions in section 5 or any other part of the code refer back to context, the, the definition of context in section 2? Or is that just due, due impartiality? Maybe uh, you want to come back to that tomorrow. I'll have to come back to that tomorrow. It's, I, I, I haven't looked at the whole of the code to see, where, or even the rest of section 5 to see if context refers I can't see the rest of section 5, so on the, the different radio provisions about undue prominence. It doesn't refer to context. It seems to be just, as far as I can see, just. Mentioned 982 times in the code as a whole. Yes. This is the advantage of having this kind of resources that I don't have before me. But one, one can see why. I mean, the ubiquity of the, of the word should not be allowed to give us uh, an importance that drives a coach and horses through the statutory standards. But that's the point. Yeah. Um, but back to the, the code in old fashioned hard copy. Uh, it's 5.6 before me that explains. Wild horses wouldn't drag me to the old fashioned coffee. <laughs> <laughs> More faith in uh, the technology than I have. Um, 5.6 deals with uh, how a series can satisfy the requirement. But if you're going to rely on a series, it should only be made clear to the audience on air. But again, one can see the flexibility in the language you air. And then. One, have, one has the reference to major political or industrial controversy. And that's at 511 and 512 on internal page number 31. And that's important because we're not just sitting here with uh, matters of controversy. Again, I think it's common ground that these decisions related to matters of major political or industrial controversy, and uh, <coughs> major matters relating to current public policy, 
And for those, there's a heightened duty of due impartiality. In addition to the rules above, the due impartiality must be preserved on matters of major political and industrial controversy and so forth um, by the person providing the service in each programme or in clearly linked and timely programmes. And then in 512, in dealing with matters of major political and industrial controversy and so forth, an appropriately wide range of significant views must be included and given due weight in each programme or in clearly linked and timely programmes. I'm pausing there, I would, again, and this goes to the dominant media narrative discussion we had with my learned friend. What's required is an appropriately wide range of significant views. It may be that one view um, is getting more airtime than other views. RT may have a particular Russian slant they want to give. But in Mr. Kuczynski's approach, where one can decide what one broadcasts by reference to everyone else, Poorer voices or quieter voices may be drowned out completely. This, this standard exists to ensure not just that the powerful uh, interests and powerful states have a say, it also ensures that less powerful interests and quieter voices are represented, even if they don't have a well-funded channel behind them or they've caught the public mood or so is this a special definition of series for the purposes of matters of major concern? Just because uh, we've taken us to 5.5, five, and th there's a definition of meaning of series of programs, which is yes. statutory wording. Yes. It's then for Ofcom to define what that means, or to set to include in standards what it means. We've got a general definition, then we've got something narrower. Yes, for the purposes th this of is this a particular category. Yes, th this, this uh, it's the same definition, but it's it's... Um, given a gloss in respect of major... The linkage has got to be clear, and, clear and, exactly. and, there's, and there's, got, there's a time requirement. Indeed. Well. Indeed. I've been told that that's wrong, but yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and, and that's important, my lord, because, because these are matters of major political controversy, and we'll come to this when we see the, the guidance, the discussion that the, my, the court had with our friend about paragraph 1.33 1, 1 of the guidance is entirely irrelevant, because in the guidance, as we'll see, it's paragraph 1.57 that applies to matters of major political controversy. For those matters, an appropriately wide range of significant views must be included. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I will we'll turn to the guidance. And one sees um, page 15 of the bundle, paragraph uh, 1.7, immediately below guidance. Uh, guidance as to Rule 5.1, how news is to be reported with due uh, accuracy and presented with due Sorry, I'm not with you. Where is the oh, guidance notes starting at page 13? Yes, my lord, and I'm on page 15. And I, I, I shan't take you through all of this because I, you've been through it, Mr. Brzezinski, and also you have read it already yourselves. I simply go to by May to 1.13, because having given guidance as to how due impartiality is to be achieved, and the guidance is constructive and flexible, um, one sees a part of 1.13, Ofcom saying it's consistently found that audiences say that impartiality and accuracy in broadcast news is important to them. For example, Ofcom's 2015 media tracker survey found that 88% of all respondents considered it important Television news is impartial, with the corresponding figure for radio news being 80%. So, uh, this is to my Lord's point that, well, who cares about impartiality anymore? You know, one can get new news from various niche broadcasters, and it's not such a big deal as it might have been a long time ago. Not so. I don't think I ever said who cares about it. I simply said that on the internet you can get it, but it's not impartial. My Lord, forgive me. Um, I'm more I'm, I was going to say I'm responding to the submission that Mr. Krasinski made. I'm not sure he even made that point. Um, but rhetorically, then, I, I say, <laughs> to the extent that it's suggested that uh, it's not important, Ofcom's own research shows that it is still valued and given significant value by uh, respondents to its survey. And um, one has updated material in the bundle, in the supplementary bundle. And we can turn to that now. It's in the supplementary bundle, tab 4, keeping open the, the guidance. In the supplementary bundle, and tab four. Page one one four. I'm looking. 
looking at the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet. In terms of how, impartiality, how important impartiality is for people, findings from the Ofcom Media Tracker show that 9 in 10, 90% think that it's important that TV news sources are impartial, compared to lower figures for radio news and newspapers. And that document, in other words, uh, if you turn back, uh, was the 2017 news consumption document published by Ofcom. And that's relevant because when we come to look at the authorities, when we come to look at um, animal defenders in the House of Lords and also in the European Court of Human Rights, the quality of the state's assessment of pressing social need is relevant. So it's not true that the due impartiality standard for broadcast news has simply been carried across from the 1950s. Not only uh, was it discussed before the uh, 2003 Act, um, it was discussed again in 2007, and Mr. Grzynski showed you an Ofcom discussion paper. And Ofcom regularly surveys as to the importance that people place, viewers place, on impartiality in broadcast news. If I may make, I have one final point to make on the guidance, and I'll probably stop, if I may, there, subject to the court. Um, I want to show you 1.33. 1.33 is uh, the paragraph that the Master Rose found rather odd, because it suggested that in certain circumstances it might not be necessary to uh, give a, a wide range of significant voices. But one sees that that, that part of the guidance uh, applies to all matters of political or industrial controversy. Uh, we are concerned, of course, in these decisions with major matters. And for that, one has to go to page 26. But one sees in red, top of 26, Rule 5.11 and Rule 5.12 in the code. You've seen that that's the part that deals with major matters of controversy. And for these matters, the test is at 1.57. Rule 5.12 makes it clear that if matters of major political or industrial controversy, major matters related to the current public policy are being dealt with, then, firstly, an appropriately wide range of significant views must be included in the programme or in clearly linked and timely programmes. And second, such views must be given due weight. And significant views could include 158, the viewpoint of nation states whose policies are considered to be matters of major political. Sorry, weight. I've lost you. Where I'm are so you sorry. Reading from now? From the paragraph immediately below, 1.58. 1.58? Yes. So this is the guidance to the um, major matters of major political. Yes. And industrial controversy provisions in the code. Yes. 5.12. So, <clears throat> broadcasters must not dismiss or denigrate such viewpoints and simply include them in a program simply as a means to put forward their own views. My lord, that was the next passage I was going to read. Yes. That's. Yes, yes, indeed. I, I rely on that. That's, has that been relied upon before? We certainly showed it to the original court before. I don't know if it's, it doesn't appear in the decision. Sorry, it doesn't appear in the, um, the judgment. And then does it appear in the decision? I don't think it does, my lord, no. Right. There's nothing going on behind you. Well then, <laughs> maybe you can tell us tomorrow. It does, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's that time of the day. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be given the page reference. Yeah. Oh, of course it does. It appears at the very beginning of the... Um, where, where there's the, a where the provisions are recitation. Yes, indeed. <coughs> of the, 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 as it were, legislative context. Exactly, yes. And it also appears at the 
before the individual parts where I think they're dealing with the provisions have been breached. But I'll, I'll, when I come to those decisions tomorrow, I will show you precisely where it's mentioned. But I will take you. Thank you. Briefly to. Oh, no, I'm, I'm stopping now because. Uh, well, that's very convenient. Okay. Well, I'll, well that's good. Thank you. We'll resume at ten thirty in the morning. Thank you. Bye. Bye.